Oh, he looks like he's. Go ahead. Well, we're waiting for you know our our, our moment on camera. So good morning. Um, good morning. So good, good to see everybody. So the, at the start of the school year, of course, we've been we've been there's no lull here and there's no break. We've we've been just muscling through all summer. You know, good stuff, more stuff happening. So I'm very glad to have you all here. Very very glad to be able to have Representative Lenny Mira. He was been a very good friend to the Council on Aging, and the Council on Aging in our district has really given us great advocacy and support. Really appreciate that. You guys do a great job. It, he's here on a monthly basis. If you need to talk with him, he and Dick Curran from Senator Tarr's office come in and right. share legislative hours, and it's been very helpful to have people be able to know that they can find you once a month. Absolutely. Um, next month it will be. It's hard to believe it will be October. I think it's, I think that's right, first Thursday, I think it's October 4th, 4th, plus, yeah. Um, Chief Mitchell, Fire Chief Mitchell will be our guest speaker and talk to, you know, that besides October is generally Fire Safety Awareness Month, and so <coughs> Chief Mitchell will come and, you know, give us an update of what's happening in his department and provide us with some good and important safety information. So that'll be good. We'll look forward to that. I haven't planned November yet. Oh, I'm going to get Karen Tyler, our veteran service officer, for in November if she's available. All right. So I'm going to turn it to you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for thank having me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's always so much fun to have you here. I'm going to slide back. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming out. It's always a pleasure to do a breakfast at the Council on Aging. Uh, like Colleen was saying, uh, we do have office hours on a regular basis right here in this building. Uh, Senator Tarr and I will uh, do office hours probably like the second Tuesday of every month. It's open to the public, not just Georgetown, but any of the surrounding towns. I've got seven towns in my district. Anyone is welcome to come. We've heard from a number of you guys, and uh, it's always a pleasure to see someone there. And like Colleen said, my name is Lenny Mayor. I'm the state rep for the second Essex district. That includes the town of Georgetown. And uh, we like doing these kind of breakfasts and uh, meetings. Um, it's especially fun to do it when there's good news to report. And we do have some good news this year. Uh, in prior years, uh, just to let you know what's going on if you can help. Um, tax revenues had come in below expectations the last several years in a row. So the governor, Charlie Baker, was forced to make nine seat cuts at the end of the last several fiscal years. This year, things have turned around. Uh, we think, you know, it has a lot to do with the federal tax cuts that were put in place. Uh, you'll recall we cut the corporate tax rate. And that incentivized corporations to keep their money here in this country instead of hiding in other countries. It's had a profound effect on our economy, and tax revenues have come in way above expectations. We have a budget surplus this year, and that's a great thing. So what a lot of us are trying to do with that money is increase local aid. That's Chapter 70, which is money the states give to schools, uh, to cities and towns. There's Chapter 90, that's the money we give to cities and towns for road repairs. And then there's unrestricted fiscal aid uh, that we also give up. And we're trying to increase all those things. And by doing that, by increasing the state aid to cities and towns, uh, we're able to keep your property taxes in check. That way your taxes don't have to go up higher than they have to. Because we've heard from a lot of you, uh, property taxes are an onus, especially for seniors. Uh, you know, I live in West Newbury, next to town over, the, the property taxes in my house are over $10,000 a year. And that's not so unusual anymore. And so we're trying to keep a lid on that by increasing local aid. The other good news is that, um, we're counting about 180,000 new jobs in Massachusetts. That is a lot of jobs. Uh, businesses are coming here, they're staying here, and they're growing here. Not an easy thing to do in a place like Massachusetts. Uh, you know, we, we are a high tax state. We have a lot of regulations. Um, we've had a reputation of being uh, less than business friendly. Of course, we work very, very hard to change that. And this is an across the board thing. It's, it's a bipartisan thing too. You'll often see Governor Charlie Baker at events would say, uh, Mayor Marty Walsh of Boston. And that's because they work together to bring companies here and make sure they stay here and grow here. And they brought in companies like General Electric and some others, and they are creating jobs, and not just any jobs, they're bringing in high paying jobs. People that will make um, their careers in Massachusetts, put their roots down in Massachusetts, bring their kids here and raise them here. That's what we want to see. The other thing that helps us, of course, is our colleges and universities. Um, I hate to think what our Commonwealth would look like without them. Uh, they've done a phenomenal job bringing in the best and brightest from not only across the country, but across the world. And it, it, you know, it, it leads to something else. You know, we, we talk a lot about uh, immigration 
And what I like to talk about is good immigration, uh, which does happen. Well, we can bring in people from other parts of the world, come to Harvard, MIT, Boston College, Boston University. Uh, these people are coming here becoming scientists, engineers, physicists. And that is the reason why companies want to come to Massachusetts, because they know we have the brain power to supply their businesses the best and brightest around. Um, like I said, it's a hard place to do business in Massachusetts. Our taxes are high. We have a lot of regulations. And companies certainly don't move here because of the weather. We count on that. Uh, they come here because they know they can hire good people. In fact, if there's any complaints um, that we're hearing a lot of on Beacon Hill, the biggest complaint I get is from employers, companies, that are telling me that they have so many job openings they can't even fill them. They're having a hard time hiring people, uh, which means if we're going to have a problem, that's probably a good one to have. And something we're happy to report on, something we're happy to talk about. We are addressing it. Uh, the governor has been instrumental in not only funding uh, regular education, but also vocational education. Vocational education is something that we think was overlooked in the past. And there is a crying need for everything from plumbers, electricians, carpenters, people to do the blue collar jobs uh, that we used to have a lot of workers for, and now we're seeing a shortage of workers for. Every plumbing company I talk to, every electric company I talk to, is telling me this. They're having a hard time hiring people, especially for jobs that require a license, like plumbing, electricity, HVAC. But even in the companies that are doing things like landscaping, which does not require a special license, even those companies are telling me they're having a hard time hiring people. And, you know, that's due to a lot of things. Uh, one thing is the communities in this area, in Massachusetts in general, we're, we're aging. We're aging and staying in place. Uh, the average age of people in this part of state is increasing. And we're trying to change that. We want families to come here. We want families to bring their kids here, raise their kids here. And places like Georgetown are a great place to do that. We have a phenomenal school system in Georgetown. Just to point it out, the test scores for Georgetown are well above the state average, and this is in a very competitive state, and the cost per student is below average. The schools in this area are doing a great job. What kind of incentives does Massachusetts give General Electric, and what does the taxpayer get? In That's a good question. It's a combination of state and local. So at the local level, I believe Governor Tom, Mayor Marty Walsh provided them with property tax relief in exchange for General Electric uh, buying or leasing some of the buildings down in the Seaport area, and they're supposed to use their money, GE money, to uh, rebuild those buildings. In exchange, I believe the mayor gave them some property tax relief. At the state level, uh, there may have been some tax relief in the form of income tax relief to incentivize them coming here from Connecticut. Uh, it's highly detailed. Uh, I can certainly get it, but I think it was a combination of both those things to answer your question. Now, what are we getting out of it? Uh, that's a good question. And we've got to be careful on how we do this. We can't just be throwing around tax incentives to every company that wants to come here. Obviously, taxpayers need some relief as well. And we're already a desirable place to do business. There's already a demand to come to Massachusetts. So I'm hoping we don't make a habit of doing that, to answer uh, your question, because it, it, it's something that companies should do. I come from the business world. I was in the construction industry for 30 years before I got elected. Uh, and that's small business, very different than big business like GE. But still, the incentives remain the same. Companies will come here, there's a good economy, and they know they can grow here. And so the state has to be careful in how we dole out these tax benefits um, to, to lure companies here. I think right now we don't need to lure companies here. And you know, you may have seen in the news that we might be spending money to bring the Pawtucket Red Sox to Worcester and call them the Wool Sox or something like that, which is great. I'd love to see the minor league team go to Worcester. Worcester could use some help. But at the same time, um, I'm questioning the deal. How much is this cost in tax base? And why do we have to do that at this time? If we were suffering from jobs, if we were suffering from a slow economy, I could almost understand it, but um, I think we have to be careful how we do that. I really do. Sure. That, that is correct. That's a good question. That's a good question. Yep. That's a crowded area already. And don't forget, we have a giant casino about to open in the Everett area as well. In an area that is already facing a lot of traffic problems. Okay. Uh, 
I almost call it the Wynn Casino, but they're calling it something else. I guess they're not allowed to use his name on that casino. Another one in Springfield. Okay. One in Springfield just yeah. opened as well. But the pie is smaller and smaller. Yeah. Which is good in a way. Uh, Springfield has been suffering for a long time, a long time now. Um, they do need some jobs out yeah. in Western Mass. And it kind of makes sense to have <laughs> some economic growth in that part of the state rather than trying to shoehorn more into the Boston area. So um, I haven't been to it, but. Um, Hope to see it someday. Doug? Well, there is a, uh, a proposed huge water park out by, uh, year round water park out by Springfield. So that area has been economically fine for a while. It looks like yeah. it's going to be having a place to drive them on. But I did have a question for you. One regarding education. Is, is, is there a status or what is the status for there was proposed legislation to make civics mandatory? Oh, yes. I, we've got that passed this session. This that session passed? Uh, at the end of July. And my colleague, I believe the state rep, Linda Dean Campbell, was spearheading that effort to teach civics in our classrooms to require it as part of our overall curriculum, which is something that just about all of us agreed on. This is a bipartisan thing. Um, I'm glad you brought it up, Doug, because, you know, it's campaign season. I'm going around, and you'd be surprised at the number of people who, um, not only don't know who their state rep is, they don't even know they have a state rep. They don't understand we have a state government. And we want to change that. That's not a good thing. We just had a primary election where we were hoping to get 10 to 20 people, 10 to 20 percent of the voters out there. We may have gone a little bit over that, maybe 25 percent, but that's a shockingly low number. Shockingly low. I mean, you consider what people did to make sure we ended up with the rights. Well, people died for that right. And we have a general election coming up in November, and the estimates are that maybe 50 percent. If 50% you know, even show up to the election. Another question. Sure. You know, the Western Mass, yep. Berkshire, I used to live there. They don't have the Boston channels anymore. The Boston what? Uh, news channels, channel five. Okay. Four or five. So they're completely disengaged from the Capitol. Do you know anything about that? Why that mm -hmm. occurred? No, I did not. No, I thought with KBTV, they would have that. They're completely disengaged because, I mean, Get the Albany Channel 13 and so forth, but it's not Massachusetts. Oh, no, so uh, I was wondering if you knew anything about that. I didn't know. I thought with cable TV, you know, they would be able to get that. What we did do, and this began under the previous governor, uh, Governor Deval Patrick Keys, spent a lot of money on what they call last mile connection to bring high speed internet to that part of the state because the cable companies will do that here in this part of the state because there's a lot of houses that are densely populated. So Comcast, Verizon, and other companies will spend the money in this part of the state because they can sell a lot of subscriptions. In the western part of the state, where it's less densely populated, they just weren't investing. So we kind of invested some state money to do exactly what you talked about, to make sure that at least the schools and institutions out in that part of the state ended up with high-speed internet. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a, some people are calling it a utility now. It's almost a necessity because you're kind of out of the loop if you don't have that. The ball pack, if you lived in Richmond, nice area. They didn't have it there. Okay. So, that <laughs> That's right. Are you applying? Got it now. Yeah. Got it now. Okay. But no, it, it was continued under the government. It was a bipartisan thing. We want to see those people connected out there. Yeah. We do. I'm sorry. Sorry, I can't even back. I worked work the polls at the elections for a good many years. Yep. People come into the town hall at the end of the election to pay a bill, a lot of business. They want to know what's going on. They don't even know the election. Yep. That's a good point, but that's why we want to teach civics. <laughs> that's an excellent point, and that's why this is a bipartisan thing. We want our students to understand <coughs> civics. We want them to understand they have a state government, a federal government. We want them to understand they have a local government. Not only to let them know that we have it, but they can participate in that government as well. I mean, there are seats in local government that are open to young people that they can run for, they can serve on a zoning board, a zoning board of appeals, planning um, board, and we want to see these young people engaged because too many people are often not engaged. And what I've seen that lead to is um, a lot of distrustfulness and, and the, the, the divisiveness you've seen today, and I've never seen this country so polarized, a lot of it is based on a simple lack of knowledge of how our system works and the tools you have at your disposal to change things you disagree with. For instance, I tell people that you as a resident can pass a bill on Beacon Hill. You can pass a bill by request. It's called by request, and any 
constituent can do that. You go to your state representative, that's me if you live in Georgetown, and say, I want a bill that does X, Y, Z, or whatever. And that bill, you can get at the hearing, you could appear at the hearing, because all our hearings are open to the public. You can speak on it, people can show up and speak against it, but the process is open to the public. And we want to encourage that, because when people stay disengaged from the government process, I think it leads to a bad place. And, you know, I was one of those people, people ask me, why did you run for office? You had a successful business, um, you worked in construction, what made you run for office in the first place? And I was one of those people that complained about government all the time. I said, they're spending too much money, they waste too much money. And I used to write letters to the editor, I used to write editorials for the Newbury Boy News, and that's great, but you know what, at some point, you gotta stop complaining and throw your hat in the ring. And that's what I did. In 2012, I ran, I had never run for anything. I had never even ran for class president, honestly God. I was a complete unknown. And I just banged on a lot of doors, spoke to a lot of people, and my message resonated. It was a time when a lot of people were concerned about runaway spending, runaway debt, and so I got elected by talking about those things. And make no mistake, those things are still a problem. Uh, things are great right now in Massachusetts. We have a budget surplus, uh, we're paying our bills, but we are still incurring a massive amount of debt. Cities and towns are accruing debt. The state has one of the highest per capita debt in the country. And the feds, of course, have a runaway debt problem with our uh, annual deficits and a, a national debt that is off the charts. And it's something we need to be concerned about because on top of all that debt, we have what are called unfunded liabilities, okay? The state and local workers who are expecting pensions for the rest of their lives, um, those are billions of dollars in the hole. And it's gonna have to be addressed at some point. Those things still concern me. And it's something we need to keep an eye on. We all like to spend money on people. Uh, we like bringing money home to our districts. Uh, we like fixing Route 133 and uh, Andover Street. We'd love to do that. And we'd love to um, build buildings. But at some point, we have to remember, uh, this all adds up to debt. We always have to keep an eye on it. It's one of my biggest concerns. Sir. Why is it, in my, in your taxes, are going to pay Illegal. Yeah. I hear that a lot. I hear that a lot. And you know what, sir? <coughs> There's not a good I'm answer. I'm an mm -hmm. And I didn't ask for a damn thing in my team. I get the first 20 years coming here, spent in the military. <coughs> and I have to pay for those illegals. What country did you come from? I came from Newfoundland. Thank you for coming here and thank you for your service. My own parents are immigrants, sir. Um, I'm not looking for that. Yeah. I'm looking for a faction to get rid of all of the illegals. I, I, I hear this a lot, and um, <clears throat> it's a top priority. It's difficult to talk about because um, the minute someone talks about doing something about illegal immigrants, uh, someone will invariably play the race card, which I think is unfortunate and wrong-headed. Um, immigration laws have nothing to do with race. Um, Regardless of what country you come from, regardless of what skin color you are, you need to come to this country legally. My own parents, I'm not anti-immigrant, my own parents came here from Italy. They came here with nothing, and like you, sir, they got nothing. They got nothing from their government. In the 1950s when they came here, they told me they had to have a sponsor and go before a judge. And that sponsor had to make sure that these immigrants would never become a burden on society. And that's all we're asking. There's nothing racist about that. There's nothing mean-spirited about that. And I think you're 100% correct on that, sir. And, and we are spending money on illegals. You'll often hear people say they can't qualify for welfare benefits or EBT cards or housing, but we know they are. It's, sure. it's costing us a lot of money. <clears throat> the sad thing is we can't even get a firm grip on that number. If you Google it, the cost of illegal immigrants, you'll see a number uh, from Massachusetts is around $2 billion. Right. Billion with a B. That's about 5% of our overall budget. And it may not be that high, but even if it's half that high, $1 billion, that's a lot of money. For $1 billion, we could fund all of the necessary school um, requirements that we have with special ed and uh, our, our base budget, and, and also have money left over for roads, bridges, seniors, and veterans. And it's something that needs to be addressed, needs to be a conversation, and I hope you vote in November, sir, because um, that is a top priority of mine. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate it. Every four years. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I've worked uh, uh, 20 years for DSS. I'm sorry, DSS? D DSS, okay. which is yeah. uh, DCF now. And 
also uh, with the local mental health crisis team for 30 years. And uh, I've seen a lot of broken people, and uh, I've seen folks uh, who are here questionably, legally. Yeah. Um, but there was, uh, you know, a very strong scuttlebutt that people people are directed to and attracted to Massachusetts because it's free. Yeah. In other words, an awful lot of uh, benefits. Um, regarding uh, illegal immigrants, there is a difference between <coughs> <laughs> between civil rights um, and uh, human rights. Right. And I think, uh, you know, I'll take any stranger in out of the storm unless they got a gun on me and you know, whatever. Right. But uh, then I'd probably say, well, yes, come on in so I can trick you. And, anyway, but the point is, um, when you come here unauthorized, you don't have civil rights. And uh, it's a very difficult thing. There's an awful lot of e emotion, uh, yeah. uh, assignment of motivation. Um, uh, anyway, that kind of sets up so much of this polarity. So I guess my point is that, yep, it would be good if Massachusetts wants to continue in some kind of leadership right. to, to, to do this. But uh, then politically, I mean, I don't know how much uh, of the, uh, the Democratic, uh, no, the Democrat cadre of the state has e enough um, uh, wisdom and discretion to be able to help turn that around. Uh, you certainly know what it is to be a minority, yep. and it ain't because you're Italian. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, so we have to really see what is, and when we, we identify what it is, then we can begin to do something about it. And a lot of people don't really define it except uh, from a sense of victimization. And it's real easy to be like that. I mean, there are times, you know, when I, uh, my wife and I would like to do some, something, and uh, we may not, because there's some kind of law or whatever. And sometimes, uh, you know, what? Oh, this is the short end of the stick again. Right. So you know, you can get into this mindset of uh, being the victim. I right. understand yeah. that, and it takes an awful lot of uh, 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 strength and uh, a discussion and outreach uh, uh, to uh, come to some re resolve. No, it's well stated, sir. Thank you for stating it so eloquently. Oh, you nailed it. You really have. And 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 uh, Sue Bagel is my wife. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, and she was interested in uh, the private citizen doing some kind of uh, filing a, a bill. What do you call it? It's, it's called yeah. It's called filing bill by request. Well, okay. And then you can put the citizen's name on the bill as well. Yeah. And we'll they'll assign a number to it, mm -hmm. and at some point we'll there'll be a hearing scheduled for it. The hearing will be open to the public. Yeah, we could do that absolutely. You know, the, the session has been shut down since the end of July. It will not be open until um, the new uh, legislature this morning in January. Yeah. So at that time, we absolutely could do that, and we would like to because you've hit a, a lot of good points. Something I mentioned earlier about good immigration. You know, it, it, we have a huge need for doctors and nurses right now. There is a shortage of nurses. And we don't have enough GP doctors, general practitioner doctors. So if someone from another country wants to come here and do those things, become a nurse or a doctor or a physicist or, some, or whatever, that's a good thing if they do it legally. If they come here, they do it legally, they pay their taxes. That ends up being a net gain for the Commonwealth because they're going to pay more taxes than they cost us. And don't forget, we have programs like Social Security, Medicare, that we all want to see funded. We want to see those programs stay solvent and properly funded so that you know guys my age can eventually look forward to it. But in order for that to happen, we need younger workers to come in and do these jobs. And right now, that's a real issue because the fertility rate in this state, in this country, has plummeted. 
Americans are not having babies like they used to. Okay? We're not creating workers like we used to. So if someone wants to come to this country and fulfill those jobs that are in very high demand right now, it ends up being a good thing. But, but the way you talk about it is exactly right. It's got to be done correctly. It's got to be regulated. You can't just throw open the doors and let in anyone and everyone. Um, you know, immigrants need to be vetted. You know, background search is done, and they need to make sure that they're obeying the law, paying their taxes. And my parents did it. You did it, sir. And people like yourselves made this country what it is today. You did. Uh, immigrants built this country, but it was immigration done correctly. It was regulated and it was done on the books and, and in the right way. Is Boston a sanctuary city? Yes. Uh, Somerville, Boston, I think Amherst as well. Who, who, um, who, who decides that? Good question because <laughs> at the Mayor? municipal level, um, it's, it's decided by the residents. They vote and on Real us. quick, does that mean that the federal government, who they want to withhold uh, extra benefits to the state? Yeah, that's a good question. Know, it's, it's, very, it's very contentious, but like this gentleman is saying, there was a lawsuit, and I think the feds lost. They, they cannot do that. They cannot do that. Um, but to, we have to feed them. No, you're right. There was a lawsuit, and you're right, sir. Um, so to answer your question, no, they're not allowed to do that. But it's a real issue right now because um, there was a measure to make the entire state of Massachusetts a sanctuary state. Um, it was put in the Senate by um, Senator Eldridge. He did it during budget session. So it was in the Senate version of the budget. When the Senate came back to the House, I believe the Speaker of the House, Robert Leo, got together with some of his colleagues in leadership and they removed it. So it did not become law in Massachusetts, but it will come up again. It's called um, the Safe Communities Act. And I'm against it. I'm not afraid to tell you. It's called it's the Safe Communities Act. And I think it'll make us less safe. Um, you know, what the Safe Communities Act would do in making us a sanctuary state is it would inhibit and even prohibit our law enforcement agencies from working with the federal agencies in the enforcement of our immigration laws. And I, I just think that's a terrible idea. I, our law enforcement agencies need to work with the feds on the enforcement of immigration. Uh, this doesn't mean treating them badly. This doesn't mean separating children from their families. We can enforce immigration without separating children from their families. Uh, that's just cruel. But we do need to enforce these laws. I mean, every country has immigration laws. And every country enforces them. And we can't have a state like Massachusetts going rogue by saying, oh, no, we're not going to enforce them, and we're not going to allow our police departments and our other law enforcement agencies from cooperating with the feds. They do need to cooperate. And uh, if I can just editorialize, we have an excellent police department in Georgetown. Uh, the chief is Donald Cudmore. That is a super educated guy doing a phenomenal job, very quietly. No one hears from him. But you know what? He's a, a very intelligent man, very well educated, and his officers do a phenomenal job. And by passing something like the Safe Communities Act, we're kind of, um, we're handcuffing them. We're handcuffing the police. We're taking tools away from them. That's not something we want to do. Those guys need help in, in enforcing our law. He just did a major drug bust. Caught someone with not only illegal substances, but counterfeit money, sawed off shotguns, weapons um, violations, and he needs help. His officers are bravely storming in and taking care of these criminals. And sometimes these criminals are being released in the streets. And you can imagine how frustrated and angry a police officer would be at that, because they risk their lives to take those drug dealers off the street. Make no mistake, drugs are a serious problem. There's a horrible ep opioid epidemic in the state. Heroin is a horrible drug. It's killing, we're burying four people a day because of overdoses. Just in Massachusetts, every single day we'll bury four people. It's horrible. And it doesn't help by taking away tools from our police department. Uh, and I say this about Donald Trump, I say about all the towns in my district. Uh, I got Groveland, West Newbury, Merrimack. They all have chiefs that are very well educated, very well trained, been on the job a long time. They do a phenomenal job. But they've got to have the tools to do their jobs. So, uh, I guess I, I would ask who. Yes. Who is taking away the tools? Can you, can when you, you become a sanctuary, when you become a sanctuary city, well, the city of Somerville, uh, city of Boston, uh, Amherst, those, those. So is it the residents of Somerville, or mm -hmm. is it uh, the town government? Uh, I believe it would go. Not that it has to be either or. I'm sure mm -hmm. most things in life are. Economy. I believe it would start with city council and go to the mayor. Oh, really? They have to vote on it. Oh, it's a law. Yeah, they have to vote on it. So those communities, those municipalities, voted on it. Oh, yeah. 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 So. Uh, but, but it's voted on in those municipalities, and it's not something 
that, you know, a state rep can do anything about. I mean, sure. I'm a state rep for the second Essex. None of my towns are sanctuary cities. It's not something I or even the governor can really do much about. But if there's a proposal to make the entire Commonwealth, the entire state a sanctuary city, yeah. obviously we come into play. Yeah. And um, people ask me all the time, how would you vote on it? And I tell them, without even thinking about it, I would vote against it. I'm not in favor of becoming a sanctuary state. I'm opposed to it. Would you have any statistics on how many it's hired to leave the aliens and what it costs to support them? Yeah. You know, like if you have welfare, staff, food stamps, all of this? I tried looking this up. If you Google it, like I said, you'll come up with a number of around $2 billion. And my colleague Jim Lyons, who stayed working with me, will talk about this all the time. It's billion with a B. Now, that might be a little high because some of those immigrants are also paying taxes, so it offsets what their cost is. But still, it has to be done legally. And we're, we're trying to get a firm grip on what that number is, because we know that there is a cost. And we're just having a hard time getting the various agencies to cooperate with us in coming up with that number. But I would love to know what, what it's costing us. I wish I had an answer for you. They gotta come to Ellis Island. I got a lot. The front door, not the back door. Thank exactly. <laughs> We're not opposed to immigration, but come in the front door, not the back door. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. The Congress has some more work to And they close out all the mental institutions. You know that? Close them all out. Today, where do people got problems? Where do they go? That is a serious Hard problem. to know. Huh? Hard to know where they go. Yeah. I spent a career <laughs> dealing with those kinds of situations, resources. Well, it, some of them were shut down more recently, too. Uh, yeah. There was an institution in Danvers, up the hill. You can see it right from the highway. I believe Avalon Bay bought it. The yeah, Danvers State, State Hospital. Hospital. Yeah. Oh, that, okay, thank yeah. you. That Thousand was, State Street from <clears throat> That was shut down. Not after World War II, it was back in what, the 70s or 80s? Uh, yeah. 53% yeah. of the people in the United States has medical problems. Medical problems. Yeah. 53%. Bill Wells shut that down. And they have no place to go. Is that in the uh, 1990s? Okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, there's an awful lot of contribution. I'm sorry, Bill. Go ahead. No, no, no. Not that I want to digress from the Right, right. But what is the, how is the state addressing or how are they going to bolster uh, vocational education? We had a ribbon cutting uh, just this past year mm -hmm. at Whittier Vocational mm -hmm. Tech. The governor was there, cut the ribbon on it himself, um, where we retrofitted uh, and replaced a bunch of the machines in the machine shop there. All state of the art. <coughs> I don't know if you've been to a machine shop lately. Uh, the days of dialing in everything mechanically are kind of going by the wayside. It's all done electronically with computers, which is good because we need some young people to get into that field. I believe the age of the average machinist is about my age. I'm in my 50s. That's old. And we need young people to go in it. So one of the things we're doing, Doug, is we're replacing the old equipment at these vocational schools to try and expand them. And Whittier is kind of a victim of its own success. It is so popular and so effective. There is a line to get in. There is a backlog. Some students can't even get in. Mm -hmm. Not only for this district, people from out of the district are trying to get into Whittier because they're doing such a phenomenal job training their students. Uh, they have a number, I think around 97% of what they call positively placed. 97% of the students that leave that school are positively placed, meaning they either got a job or they're furthering their education. When they come out of that school, there's a waiting list of companies trying to hire you. And it's everything from culinary arts, you know, cooking and hairstyling, makeup, to the industrial arts like the um, machine shops and bricklaying and carpentry and plumbing. And like I said, there is a huge need for these things. Um, you know, people often ask, why do we spend so much money on our buildings here in Massachusetts? Why does every school, court, or library cost so much per square foot compared to the rest of the country? There's due to a lot of reasons. You know, you got police details and prevailing wage laws, but also because there is a lack of workers. There is a huge demand for those kind of workers, and a very short supply of them. They're very high in demand. The gentleman in the corner had his hand up. I would agree with you all. Well, thank you. Absolutely. And less college, and more local college. Because if a student gets out of the division of Whittier Vocational Correct. Oh, okay. Thank you. And uh, they get out of there, if 
before they're out of school even, they have a good paying job. Yes. So these kids are going to fall with the building of the debt that we yeah. have to their life paying for. That's and exactly right. You nailed it. Yeah. Or much more than that. Mm -hmm. And even they still provide enough to get into those colleges. It's not enough. Even if the college would go on further and then engineering or electronics or whatever the space or whatever you call it, but uh, a strong emphasis on the Thank you. Well, no, you're exactly right. I'm glad you didn't say that. No, I hear it all the time. Companies are complaining to us about a lack of workers. And it's everything from landscapers to high tech workers to the healthcare field. Uh, There's demand on all of them. The young people today don't want to get their hands straight. A lot of them, a lot of them don't. Um, you know, when I grew up, our family had a construction company. You uh, got dirty. As a teenager, from a, yeah, literally in the trenches. When, I see, when people say they start in the trenches, I literally started in a trench with a pick yeah. and shovel. Came home filthy every day, absolutely. Um, and, and you're right, you don't see as much of that anymore. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. So, Bunny, I want to go to the opioid. Uh, oh, the yes. You had mentioned, uh, you know, our own chief. Yes. And uh, I, I will say that our town probably needs another two to three full-time police officers. Oh, wow. but it also needs to be all kinds of training for those officers yep. to, uh, oh, good thing you brought that up. Uh, that was a big issue this year in the budget, funding our police academy. Uh, most states have one academy for all the police officers. And Massachusetts has separate academies uh, for state police and local police, and they're always struggling for funding. They wanted a positive, reliable uh, supply of funds every year so that they wouldn't have to fight for them. Um, every police chief in my district brought this up, though, so I'm glad you did. They have to fund these things, they have to buy their own books, they have to pay for supplies, pay for our guys to go out there and get trained. And, and believe me, we all want to see our police officers trained. Uh, we don't want to see them, we don't want to see police officers on the job who are untrained and don't know how to do that very difficult job. So what we did this year is, um, there's a fee put on car rental, they have a $2 fee. It's only paid, it's not for every day. If you rent a car for a week, it's two dollars. If you rent it for a day, it's just two dollars. That little two dollar fee will pay for our police academies. And it'll be dedicated to just that. It won't go to the general fund and spent elsewhere. It'll be dedicated to our police academies. And I voted in favor of it because I, I think police training, I'm a fiscally conservative guy, but something like police training is what I would call a basic function of government. Uh, all our police officers work for the government, they work for you know, cities and towns, or they work for the state police, they're funded by taxpayers. We're responsible for making sure they're properly funded and properly trained. We want to make sure they have the proper equipment and that they know how to use it. Uh, you know, the news is full of stories of police officers behaving badly, not doing their jobs correctly. Well, a lot of that comes down to training. But we don't want to see that happen in Massachusetts. We want to see our officers trained. Every police chief brought this up to me and uh, they wanted us to pass. They said, pass overwhelming, it's a bipartisan thing. Well, the same would hold true, I think, with that fire department, because yeah. with this, all this fentanyl that we hear about, if they go to respond to an accident scene, or even in a, a residence or a building, uh, just exposure to that can cause great harm. Right. Okay. So there needs to be that training and equipment. Well, that's what brought up this debate in the first place, though. I learned that the fire department already has a steady funding supply for their training. Apparently there's a tiny fee put on our homeowner's insurance that is dedicated just for that. It goes just for the training of firefighters. And they put that in years ago. And so maybe the police officers were a little bit jealous of that. They said, why can't we do that? And it makes sense because that's not something that they should have to fight for. We've got to train our firefighters and our cops to do their jobs correct. And Doug, you brought up something right. Um, we hand out fentanyl, which saved countless lives, but it's got to be used correctly. And everything from the jaws of life to our very complicated equipment has to be used correctly. It doesn't happen on its own. They don't teach this in grade school. They have to go to a training academy. And there's no cheap way out of that. It has to be funded. And the fee that we put on insurance is it's tiny. I want to say it's less than 1%. You barely notice it. And it's, it's paid through homeowners insurance, which kind of makes sense, too, because firefighters are tasked with the job of putting out a fire at your home. Yeah. Should that happen? So it makes sense. A tiny amount of money for each homeowner, and it probably funds our firefighter training. So, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. That I forgot all about that. But uh, thank you for having me speak, guys. I, you know, I, I like doing this job. I love speaking to people directly like this, and I really like hearing back uh, from constituents and voters. Um, 
And even if you're not in my district, I like hearing the opinions of people out there. That's why I do a lot of office hours. I try to go around to every town, and I have regular ones here in Georgetown, and by all means, please come by. Doug has been by a couple of times. Uh, most of the time, nobody shows up at these office hours. No one comes in, uh, which is unfortunate. We'd love to hear from you. Even if you just want to talk about something like, you know, illegal immigration, what are we doing about it, or roads, bridges, schools, whatever the case may be. But uh, thank you for having me speak here. Thank and, you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you for speaking. Mm -hmm. I always get nervous that no one can see and I'd be up there.